Who is John Bernthal? Hmm, good question. Who is John Bernthal? But I mean, there is no John Bernthal. I suppose because the writing life is so solitary, there's a childish eagerness to get away from the desk. When the time comes to go on the trip is the last thing you want to do, but you're committed to it. And, you know, one has to behave decently. You can't just cancel things at the last minute and leave people in the lurch. I feel like something out of Battlestar um, Galactica. You know? I, somewhere along the way, got a reputation of being a writer's writer. You can do no more damage to a writer than to call him a writer's writer. Because other writers won't read you, except to find ammunition against you or to find how bad your work is. Uh, and readers won't read you because they'll say, oh, he's a writer's writer. Uh, I'm not a writer's writer. I write, first of all, for myself, uh, as all writers do. And after that, when the book is finished, I want it to be read by, by readers, not by writers. God forbid. I don't write for academics or critics or book reviewers. I write for people. And every now and then, one of them will come back and say to me, uh, yes, you know, I saw what you, were, what you were doing. John, did you remember me? I'm Carla. Oh, Carla, how are you? Well, fine. Good to see you. There would be a certain number of people who would, who would ask questions. And you always know that people who really want to ask the questions are going to wait until the book signing. And then they come to you and they say, and there is, I have nothing but tender feelings for those people. Um, they remind me of myself when I was a kid, when I was starting to write, when I thought that writers were magical beings. I started writing when I was about 12, and I've never stopped since. Most of the time I spent on my own, or at least most of the time that I remember now as being interesting was on my own. And I suppose I was, like all of us, a very romantic adolescent. I mean, is there, is there such a thing as a non-romantic adolescent? But I was learning how to... I was practicing how to translate experience into words, how to push experience through the mesh of words. The pact the reader makes with the fictional text is a mysterious and fascinating one. No matter how hard the novelist presses upon the reader's credulity and willingness to suspend disbelief, the contract holds. When young writers say to me that they feel that they have something to express, I say, get rid of that immediately, right? You haven't got anything to express. Nobody's interested in what you want to say. What you have to do is make an object Put an object in the world that wasn't there. As they may be, and yet fixed forever in a luminous, unending instant. I need my own place, I need my own piece of blank wall. Uh, I envy people who can write on aeroplanes and, you know, when they're in foreign hotel rooms and said, I can't do that. I could write journalism, I can write uh, all kinds of things, but I can't write fiction when I'm away. I've got to be here. I'm not one of those people who gets up at two in the morning and works in the dark while everybody's asleep. Can't do that. I have to have the sounds of life around me, so long as they're outside the room. I don't want them in the room. But it's very important to me to have this space that I work in that is mine and that I know all the, the parameters of it, if that's the word. You know, I have my little tracks around this room. It's completely neutral. 
Um, you know, I have photographs of my children and so on to comfort me, but when I'm working, all I see is a blank wall. Sometimes you stop in the middle of working day and say, what on earth am I doing? You know, I'm supposed to be an adult person. Why am I sitting here writing these burnished lies? For whom am I doing it? Why does it seem so important to me? Why is it consuming my life? And it's interesting because when I stop writing for the day and I have my first glass of wine and I begin to turn into something resembling a human being again, I can't remember, say I've written four or five sentences in the afternoon, which would be a good afternoon for me. I can't remember those sentences. I can remember the gist of them. I can't remember, because somebody else wrote them. The person sitting at the dinner table pretending to be human with a glass of wine in his hand is not the person who is sitting at the desk writing. Come, one more effort to transfix it all, to express it all. Try. I cannot. The world is. Art is. No, no use, I cannot. You must. There must be a conclusion. A word, even. Try. Try now. Here. Could I? I was very lucky in the teachers that I had. I had a wonderful English teacher in St. Peter's College, Father Larkin. I remember him on our first day of term. He asked people to read bits of poems. And he asked me to read Keats's Ode to Nightingale, which I knew by heart. <laughs> and I read a verse or two and he said, stop, stop, you've read this before, right? And I said, yes, sir, I've read this before. Um, he was a really good teacher. He was good. He was almost as young as we were, you know. Uh, and he was an enthusiast, loved language, loved English. So he was a, a real influence. I don't know if influence is the right word. He allowed me to do things. This is what good teachers do. They allow you to do what you want to do. This year's Man Booker prize novel, John Bandles, The Sea. Describing the novel as a masterly study of grief, memory and love recollected, the judging panel said that Banville had emerged from a close contest in which the standard had been particularly high. As we know, and it's a, a cliché, but it is true, any one of these books could have won. And, um, you know, I, I, I do say to my, my colleagues, uh, just hang around, and, you know, it'll come. The acceptance speech was perfectly anodyne, didn't offend anybody. But I was interviewed by Kirsty Walk uh, for BBC Newsnight uh, shortly after the presentation of the prize. Well, I suppose it's not for me to say, but I think that it's nice to see... Oh, I've got to take a risk. It's nice to see work of art winning the Booker Prize. And whether it's a good work of art or a bad work of art, that's what I, made, I intended it to be. Partly I was being mischievous to annoy the... Middlebrow Literary Establishment. But also I meant what I said. What I set out to make was a work of art. And I felt that it was right to say, yes, it's a good thing for this kind of book to win a big prize. Yes, I was falling in love with Chloe. Had fallen. The thing was done already. I had that sense of anxious euphoria, of happy, helpless toppling which the one who knows he will have to do the loving always feels at the precipitous outset. For even at such a tender age, I knew there is always a lover and a loved, and knew which one in this case I would be. I think the reason that the sea was popular is that it has some kind of balance between grief and joy and all these things that I never thought I could do. I think a criticism of my books over the years is that they were not necessarily cold, but too... too balanced. You know, in a way, the novel should be slightly unbalanced. It should be slightly rackety. It should be slightly... should be like our lives, you know wallowing around and stuff. 
and suddenly, by some, and it's pure chance, the sea seems to have hit a balance that people find feels like the insides of their heads. This is deeply worrying to me, I can tell you. I think we have some very valuable film rights here. You know who keeps phoning me about it is Bob Bookman from CAA in Hollywood. Agents are very necessary when you're starting out because they have the contacts with publishers and, and newspapers and, you know, they move in that literary world, which is a very small world, no matter where it is. You know, there's no threat there. You're an outsider coming in. You're young, you're untried, and you need somebody to represent you. <laughs> you know, psychology one, huh? As you go on, you don't need an agent, as you did at the start. But you have to have somebody whom you know is absolutely on your side. When I talk to my agent, I know that he's going to, even if I make the most awful fool of myself in a book, he's going to say, well, you know, this may not be your best book, but we will sell it as well as we possibly can. Uh, and agents, I mean, I find it, well, my agent is, is his chief <laughs> task is to cheer me up. Ed Victor, he's a hotshot agent and uh, loves life. And we have laughs and things like that. That's worth paying 10% for, I think. We met at um, the launch That's of right. Peter That's and the right. Wolf. That's right. So when, That's what's right. the date of that? Well, that would be four years ago. Yeah, least. four years yeah. ago. And we were introduced by Paul McGuinness. Yeah. And then we met at Paul McGuinness's house the next day where he had a, a big party. And we started to talk about life and literature. Another um, thing that I'm very useful to John for is saying no. He's not good at saying no. You know the song, I'm just a girl who can't say no? That's me. I'm in a terrible fix. Well, John is invited to endless literary festivals and writers' workshops. And he's also promoting books for his publishers all the time, which is, that's a legitimate function, although there are times when you should say, well, no, I'll do it for the next novel. So one of the jobs agents have is to be the hard guy when the client remains adorable. Yes, this is a wonderful room. Uh, I wanted something new to happen. I wanted to be pushed in directions that I hadn't been going in before, because I needed to change. And Ed was very important for that. And that's just what happened. I mean, I did push you in a different direction. He was in my office one day, and I asked him whether he liked reading thrillers. And I remember you said very sharply, why do you ask that? And I said, well, because I represent the estate of Raymond Chandler, I represent Freddie Forsyth, Jack Higgins, I, I love thrillers. And John said, yeah, I like reading thrillers. Um, I like Simeno, he said. A couple of days later, he rang me and he said, I know why you asked me if I like reading thrillers. You want me to write one? And I said, yeah, I do. And I want you to write one under a completely open pseudonym. We ended up with the name Benjamin Black, he wanted to call himself Benjamin White, mm. but I said, no, no, it has to be black if you're writing thrillers. The corpse was that of a young woman, slim and yellow-haired. She had been pretty, but death had robbed her of her features, and now she might be a carving in soapstone, primitive and bland. Well, I just began to read Simenon about four years ago. I hadn't read him before. What he called his hard novels are superb, like Monsieur Mon Vanishes, Dirty Snow. He did them so simply, with such a small vocabulary, such spare means, that I was fascinated by the effects that he could achieve with those spare means and that small vocabulary. And I decided to try my hand at it. Something, his pathologist's instinct perhaps, told him what the name would be before he looked at the label tied to her toe. Christine Falls, he murmured. You were well named. I needed to give myself a, a little time out from being John Banville. So I've given myself a, a dark twin. He's a bit of an idiot. He's a bit slow. Uh, but you see, every time I talk about Benjamin Black, I realize I'm talking about Quirk, 
who is the protagonist of Benjamin Black's books, uh, who is about six foot six, an enormous bear of a man, which, as you can see, I'm not. It was too early yet for the office workers, and the broad street was deserted with not a car in sight. And if not for the rain, he would have been able to see unhindered all the way to the pepper canister church, which always looked to him, viewed from a distance like this down the broad shabby sweep of Upper Mount Street, to be set at a slightly skewed angle. It's a new Benjamin Black book, and I went through it the other day and found that it was absolutely appalling. So I'm cutting thousands upon thousands of words out of it. It's funny, you know, sometimes when a book is really very bad and you read through it, you discover that the book is there. You just have to sift out all the rubbish. It's overwritten. It's, uh, it's full of me trying to justify my characters by talking rubbish about them. And you just cut all that out and the characters stand there by themselves. Fiction's a funny business, you know? I'm playing a little bit, which is very dangerous, very dangerous indeed, because Benjamin Black could seep into the pores of John Banville's skin and invade him. And Benjamin Black could say to John Banville in that Faustian way, that Mephistophelian way, look how easy it is. Why don't you relax? Why don't you write easier books? The public would love you. Your publishers would be thrilled. You'd make a fortune. So one has to be very careful. You notice how I shift from I to one there? Benjamin and I are having this dialogue. Good God, how do you do that? I am a sick man. I am a spiteful man. Who speaks? It is her voice in my head. My Lord, when you ask me to tell the court in my own words, this is what I shall say. I do want, in the first sentence, in the first paragraph, I want to tell readers this is something new that you're embarked on here. Uh, I don't want readers to be comfortable. I want them to be interested, and I want them to be passionate, all those things, but I do not want them to be comfortable. A fine rain began to fall. It drifted soundlessly through the tangled branches and settled on the carpet of dead leaves on the ground. That sentence is a kind of, it snakes its way along. Uh, it seems to be moving through the undergrowth. It mimics what it's talking about, um, as all good sentences should, uh, even the shortest of them. Uh, they have to mimic what they're talking about. Your mind is constantly behind each sentence that, that one writes. One's mind is fitting it into the general form, uh, subconsciously. So I write each sentence, and I get it right, and I keep rewriting it. You could have a page of handwritten uh, writing, and there might be one short sentence in all that. I don't cross out, I bracket. Uh, so it's like a snail crawling across the page, leaving this horrible slime behind it. Although sometimes the slime glistens. At first, it had no name. It was the thing itself. The vivid thing. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's quite nice, isn't it? Yeah. Well, it's, it's a... Uh, because Dr. Copernicus was about a life from birth to death, it had to start with the child's inability to understand the world and to start to name it. Everything had a name. But although every name was nothing without the thing named, the thing cared nothing for its name, had no need of a name, and was itself only. Every now and then, I will write a sentence and I will get it absolutely right. It will be written. And I will hear a kind of ping that you get when you hit your nail on the side of a wine glass. There'll be that ding. Yes, that's absolutely right. That's what keeps me going. I often find that I will spend a day writing a paragraph, right? And then I look at my watch and I think, I'll stop now, it's 5.30, and then I think, uh, no, I've, I've got about 15 minutes, and I'll do something. And in that 15 minutes, the whole thing will be crystallized. It doesn't often happen, but it sometimes does. And that, 
those little moments of crystallization are probably the high points of the book in the end. I am, therefore I think. Oh, that's really pretentious, isn't it? That's really dreadful. That's really, really dreadful. I should never have written that. God. Shaw is right. Youth is wasted on the young. I suspect that for me, my conscious life really began the day that I pushed my mother away and said, no, I don't want any more kisses. I remember that very clearly. I was about four or five. I can see the scene and I can see my mother's face. Uh, it's a terrible moment in my life. It's a terrible moment in everybody's lives when they have to pull away from the mothership, you know. But I think that's when I started to be myself, <laughs> insofar as I am myself. I think that the relationship of the male artist with the mother is very, very important, always very difficult, very fraught, very tender in its way, and that a lot of art is made out of that relationship, that difficult relationship, yes. But, you know, it's kind of shameful to be embarking on your 60s and you're still whining about your mother, you know? I mean, does one never grow up? My mother brought me up to feel that I was a god. I could do anything, absolutely anything. There was nothing I could not do. And I'm eternally grateful to her for that. Both my parents did. They had lives that were constrained, that were narrow because of their circumstances of education, of class, uh, of their financial situation. But for us, for their children, we were going to be gods. <laughs> My brother always tells this wonderful story of my mother taking my brother and my sister and me into a drapery store in Wexford. And my brother heard the draper saying, oh, here they come, the royal family. Curiously, my father used to read some of my books. My mother, I don't think, ever opened one of my books because I think she was worried at what she would find, you know, she was probably worried that she would find stories about her. She was probably worried that she would find obscenities. She was probably worried that she would find out secrets about me, about my life, which she didn't want to do. Because my mother was a very reticent, uh, very self-contained person, you know. And I, I have no, again, I have no resentment about that whatsoever. I didn't want her to read my books. That was fine by me. You look at me as if to say, that must be a lie, but it's not. It's absolutely true. I, I... No, it didn't matter to me. I see them there, my poor parents, rancorously playing at house in the childhood of the world. I did not hate them. I loved them, probably. Only they were in my way, obscuring my view of the future. In time, I would be able to see right through them my transparent parents. My mother was frightened, I think, by the fact that I wanted to be something that she couldn't understand. I mean, she could understand it, but she couldn't absorb it. I think I grew up very quickly. Um, I think by the age of 12 or so, I was more grown up than was good for me. And I wanted out, I wanted out of Wexford. Um, never learned the names of the streets in Wexford because I was just lodging there until I could go. Wanted more, more, more. Wanted the world. From the point of view of a novelist, the publisher is necessary, obviously. The publisher prints your book, tries to sell it. But the editor is the really important person, because the editor is the person who saves you from your own worst excesses. What an editor is supposed to do is really suggest things which lead the author really to, to find his or her own solutions to any problems that are in the book, rather than 
you know, it's not our job to rewrite or fix the problems, it's just to, to gently guide. And, um. Authors frequently have no idea what they've made because they've been working on it for so long, they've lost sight of it. I go word blind after a couple of years of working on a book. So it's important that an editor is then able to say to you, this really is much better than you think, or it's worse than you think, or, you know, it, it, that opinion is very, very important. That faith is an intangible thing, but very important indeed. And then that faith should ideally radiate out from the editor. So, you know, initially in-house, getting everyone else in the publishing house excited about it, and then beyond that, getting the trade excited, getting the media excited. Um, you know, playing the role of champion uh, is incredibly important for every editor. My editor in my middle period was a man called Robin Robertson, wonderful poet. Uh, he was a superb editor. I mean, I remember him coming to me about the Book of Evidence, and he said, you've used the word Gubrius twice, once on page 12 and once on page 200 and something. I mean, this is before computers, where you could do word searches or anything. I told that story to John McGarren, he said, you shouldn't have used it once. <laughs> On the wedding night, in the vast four-poster, in the bedroom overlooking Stemfragasse, they collided in the dark with a crunch. He felt as if he were grappling with a heavy, hot corpse. She fell all over him, panting, got an elbow somehow into his chest and knocked the wind out of him, while the bed creaked and groaned like the ghost voice of its former tenant, poor dead Marx Muller, lamenting. Oh, writing about sex is... is almost as difficult as writing about happiness. Happiness is the most difficult of all. That's impossible. You can't do that. Uh, sex is so silly that you have to, you know, uh, you have to find metaphors and analogies that will both communicate the, the joy and the the losing of oneself and also the silliness of it. Three things the thought of you conjures up. The gullet of a dying fish into which I've thrust my thumb, the grainy inner linings of your most secret parts, ditto, and the tumescent throb in the throat of some great soprano, who, on the third held note of the second alleluia of Schubert's De Junge Nonne, O Night, O Storm. Art is suffused with the erotic. All art, in a way, comes back to the body. And if you make a real work of art, then it will be at a level of eroticism, which is very high. I mean, the artistic experience, if you listen to a piece of music, if you go to look at a beautiful painting, if you read a good poem, good novel, you will have an, an almost erotic experience because it will be a an entire experience, not just your mind, but your body is involved in it. I was sitting in a, a restaurant in Hoth one day, and it was high summer, it was...